The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. When you use the Navy Federal Cash Rewards card, you can earn up to 1.75% cash. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. It's a beautiful day. It's almost Christmas. I wish the temperature was matching the uh, time of year. That's the only problem. I don't know what the temperature is up there, Ben, but down here today, it's like in the 80s, mm-hmm. which is you just, guys are aren't you guys in Austin? Houston, Houston, Houston. OK, I was just in Austin actually like two weeks ago and it was not nice weather. No, and I, no. <laughs> it changes. It's terrible. Yeah, it changes quick. That's, yeah. a, that's another Texas rule. If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. It's like it'll change, man. Yeah. Uh, but where are you at right now? I'm in Wisconsin, so it's cold here. We actually don't have – we did have snow, but we don't have snow anymore. When I was in Austin, it was 45 and rainy, and it was just not not ideal. So um, we want some snow for Christmas. That's what we want. Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's 80 here right now, right. and it's so weird because there's a really dark um, rain cloud over us, but then the sun is just – like shining super bright through it. It's a it's an odd look outside yeah. right now. You know that temperature, uh, that forty five degree thing, and then when yeah. the you throw the rain on top of that, it's like a lockdown weather. Not good. You know Not what I mean? Good. It's yeah. just kind of there's it's life's way of saying, man. You know what you're gonna do is just sit and relax and chill. Kind of. Yeah. That's all you can do on those days. It's hard to even get the battery going. For real. Yeah, I couldn't live in Houston though. I don't like the the heat. Just the heat and the humidity that would kill me all summer. Sure. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> Uh, we, we tell people not to even come visit in August. Yeah. <laughs> For real. It, it, it's, uh, if you're not used to it, man, it'll it'll kill you quick. Yeah. yeah. We went to Santa's Wonderland last night, and it was, you know, 70. And it was just like, uh. it just doesn't get you into the magical. <laughs> <laughs> the, you're sweating, true, you're sweating seeing Santa. It's, it's just in July. July. Yeah. <laughs> it's not cool. Reindeer right. are thin. Santa's in shorts. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Those, those, those cut-off jean yeah, shorts. Trips his beard down in the summertime. <laughs> looks different. All right, here goes your Patreon question today, guys. Would you rather eat peanut butter and jelly or grilled cheese sandwiches every day for the rest of your life? Mm. PBJ for me. I'm a sucker for a PBJ. I feel like I would get sick of grilled cheese faster. So if you told me one time and I'm really debating it, if you're telling me forever, I'm going peanut butter and jelly. Same. Yeah, that's the first thing that popped into my head. I'm going to go with that as well. Yeah. Huge, huge grilled cheese fan. I have to have tomato soup if I'm having grilled cheese. I don't know why, but that like the combo is necessary for me. I feel me. like we could switch up the jellies too. And- yeah, I was thinking the yeah, same thing. With the peanut butter jelly, you got multiple. I, uh, I think we're because yeah. you could switch as the you need some crunchy, yeah. crunchy peanut butter also. Can't have yeah. smooth stuff. Yeah, you know, we had <laughs> even in the military in the MREs they gave you peanut butter, and I, I felt like I could always eat that. It's like yeah. I'm like go to. Mm-hmm. Always. Yeah, you said the jellies. You got unlimited jelly options. There mm-hmm. we go. I, I think that's the answer. I like I think it. so too. I think we should lock that down. I think grilled cheeses, there's a lot of cheese options, but I mean, I don't know. I think yeah. I get tired too. So. Yeah, it makes your tummy hurt. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the point. <laughs> 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 that's the whole point. All Has right. Anybody ever fried a, or grilled a peanut butter and jelly? That's weird. Ew. Actually, no. no I just. It, I thought the same thing until I tried it. But uh, you take a peanut butter and yeah. jelly just like you would a grilled cheese and put butter on the outside and no. toast it, toast it, it up. up. I might have that for lunch today. That actually sounds that pretty sounds good. That sounds very weird. Uh, no, All right. I never thought I'm Never it. mind. <laughs> I'm going to have it. Yeah, you got my vote. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for that Patreon question. You can head over to patreon.com slash team never quit. You get exclusive access to behind the scenes content, a great community of supporters and fellow listeners just like you guys who go the extra mile to support the show as well as get some cool content some live stream hangouts all kind of other fun stuff so make sure you guys check that out we've got a awesome guest in store for you guys ben Askren is an american former professional mixed martial artist and amateur wrestler he was the former bellator and one welterweight champion remaining undefeated for over a decade before competing in the ultimate fighting championship Ben currently hosts the Flow Wrestling Radio Live podcast as well as the Funky Crypto Show and coaches at his wrestling club. Club. Can't speak English today. AWA. Ben, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thanks again for doing this, man. Uh, got it. I, well, you're welcome, man. It's uh, I got a lot of questions. But I'll, the thing about, and we, we were talking about this earlier, with the younger generations, you see them, especially with us, our generation, when you when you're looking at them, I got kids now. I mean, you see some of the obstacles that they're not even willing to face or get over, and then they they look at some of the, some of us, and where we sit now, 
Yeah. And I'm talking about like where I started and where I'm at now, I'm two different places. Yeah, I got two different places completely. And I, I just want to hear if it's the same thing uh, with you and how it started with you. So if we get, before we get into yeah. all of the good, the, what we're looking at now, well, man, let's back it up a little bit. Well, let me tell you this though, about this generation. I have a very jaded view on this generation because I get to work with all kinds of kids who want to work really hard and they come in the gym and they bust their ass and they're not playing on their phone. And so I like <laughs> the kids that I work with are teenagers. They're freaking awesome. Um, so I have, I have a jaded view of this generation because I get to work with the ones who want to be in the gym and they want to grind all the time and, and they really love it. Um, for me, I started just kind of like a normal kid. I played all the sports. Uh, you know, that was to the early 90s when I was a younger kid. Uh, I did football, baseball, soccer, all those things. Wrestling was the one that really drew me in. Um, there was these, there's two points in my life I talk about in the book that I just put out where I hated team sports because I really wanted to win and other people on my team didn't share that sentiment. And I wasn't even like an all-star at those sports, but when it's you and you're the only one that wants to win, you can't win. And wrestling, it was just me and the other person. And I could always determine my destiny. And that was, that was kind of the first thing that I loved about wrestling. And it really started drawing me in and, and making me want to do it more. That's, that's a good point you made about with the, the younger generation, the kids, I, I, I train the, the kids going into the combine every year. Yeah. And, and it seems like when, when we were kids, they had every sport available. Like, and I, and I think they threw everything at you to figure out what you were. That was kind of the entire, the point of it in the beginning, like the wrestlers, man, you knew who them guys were, you especially know when, who they are when they walk in after they've been doing it a while. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just do it. It's a different personality wow. altogether. But when we were kids, we don't know that. That's why they, I mean, we were running around together trying to figure out what's what. And they, they, when they started removing sports away, you, you remove that avenue. There's no outlet yeah. for that. And I, the, the younger generation, man, we evolved. Like our kids yeah. are the next version of me and you. That ought to be terrifying. Look what yeah. you and I had to go through our whole lives. Yeah. I mean, what, what I, life I has thrown at us. I love it. Like my, my daughter, actually just wrestled in a tournament yesterday. She is, uh, she's almost 10 and she has now determined that she really loves wrestling. So that, it, you know, it's a lot of fun for me to see. And then my, my youngest, he turns five this week and he's pumped because we wouldn't let him do a wrestling class till he was five. So he's so jacked up to do his first wrestling class in three days. <laughs> All right. So you start him at five. I always, I always wait till, I always wait till seven. And then yeah, I wait for no. them to kind of, kind of get into it. Yeah, no, we actually, our rule is five years old. Um, but actually we really push back on the early training. Like a lot of places really want kids competing at like five, six, seven. And I think it's stupid and there's yeah. not really a big purpose for it. So, um, no, we actually push back big time on what most wrestling clubs do. Um, and we've been having a ton of success with us now. Um, no one's really questioning our methods anymore because of the amount of success that we're having. Well, that's walking the walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we have, we have 10 kids. We have 11 kids ranked in the country right now. Um, we had a junior world finalist that's 29 over the last couple of years, an NCAA champion. We had in the last two years, we had 60 kids going wrestle in college. That's amazing. So, so what do you, I mean, yeah. you attribute that to a little bit of time and in, in, in life, right? Time and rank, ages, rank. Yeah. Kind of um, so I think, you know, our big thing, our, our really big thing when we started, and it's still our big thing because it's worked, is that we want kids to develop a love for the sport of wrestling. We don't want to force them to have to work hard. We want them to want to have to work hard. We want them to love the sport, realize what it's going to take to be successful, realize what it's going to take to be the top. And then we, I don't have to ask them to work anymore. They want to come in and work. That's what we want. It, it's perpetual. It feeds itself, right? Yes. You yeah. Kind of, after, you, after you after you create that love and that desire, it kind of feeds itself. And and you see that in them. I mean, that's yes, just the bit. And, and I I try to I, I I try to explain it the best way I can. And I I know you've run across this. And if you could elaborate on it, people always like, how do you get to this point? Like, how, bro, I'm sitting here listening to you talk about your kids, and I I know your background. Yeah. And what I always boil it down to, man, is just showing up. Like, put them in the environment. Yeah. And, and let, let them respond yeah. and react to it in a positive or negative way. Or, and then you're the reinforcement in there, right? Yeah, I think that's a gigantic part of it. Um, you know, and, and what I've seen in my life, because obviously, you know, I put a lot of different sports and I've seen a lot of different coaches. Uh, a really good coach can kind of change a kid's life in the positive direction. 
And a really bad coach can can turn a kid off from the sport, right? And the sport could be the thing that changes the kid's life potentially, um, you know, moves them in the right direction. And I've seen that happen so many times. And so that's our goal with, you know, me and my brother and my high school coach started Asking Wrestling Academy in 2011. And now we've expanded to five locations. And I see that all we want to do is put great coaches in front of kids to give them a really good opportunity to succeed in wrestling. Okay. That's the second time I've heard this in, in, in so many days, really about the coaches. And I didn't, yes. and bro, I don't know what it was until I had kids and they were in the environment. Like I looked at it completely different. And then really? I was sitting there watching one of the coaches the other day that coaches my kid. And I'm glad I taught my kid discipline and manners. Cause I see some of these kids mouth and often I was like, man, I don't think that coach even likes that. <laughs> and I mean, that's hard to put effort into some, somebody if they're not, if they don't even have the discipline to receive it. Yeah. Uh, and I was yeah, thinking, I mean, I was like, I, but so, okay. Uh, I feel as though this is one of the things I, I, I was just doing a coach's clip the other day. And, you know, one of the things I feel is that our role as coaches and I, I, I the term I use a strong role model, whether it be male or female as the coach, obviously in wrestling, it's majority male, but there, there are some females, um, is that there there's some kids and, and maybe more than ever that don't have a strong role model at home that's showing them what good discipline work looks like, what work ethic looks like, how you're supposed to act. And so, you know, beyond teaching wrestling moves, which is what we do, I feel like I have such an important role to play in these kids' lives. Like I can make them realize that the way they're acting is disrespectful. Okay. That's right? what I was going. That's where I was or, going with that. You do that, right? Yeah, or, Absolutely. Or the way they're acting is not conducive to them being successful in life, you know? So I feel like our role as coaches and, and strong role models, it could be coaches, right? It could be other things also, but is is more important than ever because there's more and more kids that uh, unfortunately aren't seeing that in their life. A hundred percent. I absolutely agree. We were talking about, it's like, man, if you give your kid the one thing, the discipline, and you, you can send them out and everyone will teach them something because they can be around them. Yeah. And, and ultimately, you got, there's so many variations of our people out there. Some people can't speak, they can't hear, they can't talk, whatever. Well, they can all, if the eyes eat first. Like if you're mm -hmm. walking around acting like what you're, you're preaching, I mean, if you're actually doing what you're supposed to do, and they'll see that. Yeah. And, and a lot of places don't, they don't do that. Man, you can tell the ones that do though, the, they, yes. they produce. So taking yep. it back to, to your story, when you decided that wrestling was mm -hmm. going to be just for you, did you have a coach that was really good? Is that what I got you? Well, yeah, I, I definitely did. Um, and I had kind of a handful of them. You know, there's this book called, uh, oh my gosh, was it the talent? Now I'm forgetting which book this is from. I'm going to cite something, and I think it's from the Talent Code. Talent Code? Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I know it. <laughs> um, so it says a lot, one of the things that early a lot for early coaches, they don't need to be a high level expertise. And if they, if they are, that's great, but they don't have to be, but they do have to have a passion for that subject. And so like my first, actually, he unfortunately passed away last year, but my first like wrestling coach, like he really loved it and he really cared about the kids, you know? And so it was like, he might not have known the most moves, but he was really good for me. And then my high school coach was the coach after that. And like I mentioned, you know, I still work with, he works with us at Ashton Wrestling Academy. He's great. He was very passionate about wrestling. He had a lot of knowledge to share. Um, and then when I went to college, I had a bunch of good coaches also. So I kind of was blessed to have good coaches um, at every every step of the way. Oh, that that's a great lineup. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that talent code is a great book. Yeah, it's it, awesome. It, it really is. It's almost to the point where the when you come into this world or when you're starting something in the beginning, you don't really, I'm not saying it's not good to have them, but the guy with all the talent, you really want that guy with the enthusiasm about yeah. whatever it is. Because if they get so fired up about it, even if they can only explain one thing, yes. <clears throat> right? Even well, if they so, can only explain one thing. Yeah, sometimes being really good can be counterproductive because I catch myself doing this sometimes. Like, anything <laughs> like, well, this is so easy. Why can't you get I, it? No, bro. You know, because I want to the title and they're trying to be like, all the time. You know, part of the first moves. And I'm thinking, like, oh, God, why can't they freaking get this? So I have to remember, like, hey, this is the level that I'm teaching at. And so for this group of kids, you know, we have some kids who are trying to win world titles, right? 20 and under, 17 and under. But for the little kids, I remember that there's beginning. Like, I got to be patient. I got to just stay enthusiastic. How, how, and, and I get, them get bit really by like that it. one all the time. Because you're sitting there going, hey, why don't you? Because there's the aha moment, right? The trick. And then there's <laughs> yeah. a certain age. It's like that sinks in. You forget <laughs> about all that. Especially if you're teaching different ages and different classes and stuff like that. Sure. 
Sure. That's that's that teaches the humility for us. It's like because yeah. you got to boil it back. To, I mean, you can look at them and, and see that they're some of the stuff they're not getting. And you're like, all right, how did I learn that, man? I got to make it or I got to break it back down to the basics. Yes. 100 percent. That's awesome. So with your yeah. story in high school, you were obviously a badass in wrestling mm -hmm. and you were getting yep. it. Uh, when did you decide that you were going to do the Olympics? <laughs> Well, okay, so in, in, well, in fifth grade, I quit baseball to do more wrestling, and I got better. Um, and then by ninth grade, I decided to quit football because all, I knew all I wanted to do was wrestle. I knew I wanted to be good. And there was, uh, you know, in those days, kind of like you were talking about, um, you know, we have a wrestling came in. It's year-round for kids who want to wrestle all the time. It, it didn't exist at that point in time, you know. So my dad bought me a mat, and it was in the basement. And I, you know, I had to find wrestling partners to to come over and train with me. Um but high school is when I really kind of got all into it. Um, in the year 2000, I convinced my parents to send me to Dallas, Texas, actually, for the 2000 Olympic trials. Uh, there was like a wrestling camp alongside the Olympic trials. And I watched that and I'm like, oh, my, that's what I want to do. I want to I want to be an Olympian. All right, guys, switching gears for a moment. If you're 50 or older, or if you're close to someone it is, you won't want to miss this. If you're listening to this Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance Sponsorship ad, there's a good chance that you're alive. And if you're not, well, this may not be of interest to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. Life insurance? I'm going to live forever. Death is what happens to other people. Well, for the sake of argument, let's assume you're wrong and that someday you won't be listening to podcasts anymore. I know it's not easy to talk about, so I'll do the talking. If you're 50 plus and alive or 50 to 75 in New York, you can apply for Gerber Life Guaranteed Life Insurance with guaranteed acceptance regardless of your health. And since this life insurance is guaranteed, you don't have to get a medical exam. In fact, you don't even have to fill out a health questionnaire. For a free quote, just visit GerberLifeFamily.com. Then when you stop, I mean, if you stop listening to podcasts, your family can use the insurance money to help cover your final expenses or anything else. Your kids already inherited your ears, allergies, and questionable singing voice. Don't make them inherit your final expense tab too. See website for terms and restrictions. Um, so yeah, it was really two years, 2000. And you know, one of the things that uh, I was trying to distill the important messages from my book and one of those is great things take a long time. Like I decided in the year 2000, I wanted to be an Olympian and it took eight years yeah. to be, you know, to, to accomplish that goal. And I actually told my wife, cause I'm kind of, I know there needs to be a balance, but I was like, we freaking vacation too much. This is crap. We need to stop vacationing and start working harder. <laughs> I didn't go on a vacation for nine years. In 1999, my parents, I was eighth grade, my parents took me on vacation. Uh, 1998, um, they took me on vacation and then Every time after that, they tried to take me on vacation. I said, I'm not going. I'm not going. I, all I want to do is wrestle. All I want to do is train. I'm not going on vacation. And I didn't go on a vacation from 1998 till I think 2007. Yeah. <laughs> from the 1900s. That's <laughs> yeah, kind of obsessive. <laughs> right. You know, so I'm not, I, I, you get into that world and you, you can't get out of it. That's how you know. And what you said, though, like to be an Olympian, there, there's the moment that we all get to appreciate when they're holding the gold. But yeah. it's actually the ride. I mean, there are certain descri job descriptions down here and lifestyles that it's the whole yeah. event, not the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that there's a there's a build up, you know. It's for like me, unfortunately, I didn't get to get a medal at the Olympics, but you know, making the Olympic team and you know, winning the U.S. Open that year, like that build up for it was was huge. What's that like? I mean, I, the, when from the time you start, you go into the camp. Yeah. I mean, uh, for me at that at that point in my life, uh, there was no going into camp or anything. It was a year round obsession for, like I said, for for pretty much a decade. Um, you know, 1998 was when I was in eighth grade, and I told you know I went on vacation with my parents, and then I said I'm not going on vacation again, and all I want to do is train, and that was that was pretty much all I did for 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 a long period of time. 2007, I went on one vacation after I won my first college national title. Um, I figure I, I roared myself after a whole bunch of years. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was, a, there was no, there was no camp. There was just, this is what I did. I'm going to try to be the best wrestler I can every single day of the year. I'm going to try to get better every single day. I was completely obsessed. That's awesome. Brothers or sisters, siblings. Is this, I mean, how, how did you get yep. into that? What started that? Uh, what started that obsession? I, I, I don't, if I had that, I'd be a billionaire. Um, oh, yeah, check. but I do have a brother. He's a younger brother. He also won a national title at Missouri. 
uh, and he runs Ask Wrestling Academy with me. Um, but no, that's, that's that question about like what started it. Um, I can't, I can't really tell you that. If I could tell you, like I said, if I could tell you, I think what gave, gave me the drive that I had, because like literally throughout high school, I didn't party, didn't drink, didn't smoke. I was training like almost every single day. And, you know, you see certain kids that come through my academy and they have the same type of thing. And, you know, you want to draw like conclusions about maybe the way their parents act or, or something like that. But it just doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason, you know, because you see kids with all the same circumstances that don't really have the same level of drive. Um, they may have a good drive, but not like that really, really uber elite level. Um, yeah. And so for, for myself, I, I don't know. Like, it wasn't a movie. I, you didn't see anybody. I mean, how'd you even learn about wrestling? <laughs> Uh, I just started playing all the sports. My dad wrestled a little bit, but like I said, I just did all the sports when I was young. And then, you know, the the individualism of it, like, drew me in and the work ethic. And, you know, I was always kind of a combative. I, I honestly, well, I think most boys are combative, but a lot of boys are told not to be combative when they're young. So they stop being combative because they see it as a negative. Um, but I was very combative when I was young. And, just, yeah, it just drew, drew me in. But, you know, to when I quit baseball to be better. And then, you know, like I was making all of those decisions. My parents weren't making that decision for me. That was me. And yeah, like through high school, like to not, to just be so obsessed. I don't know. I don't know like what the brain chemistry is that made me be that way, but that, that's how I was. Were your parents supportive or were they annoyed that you were just obsessing over this? Um, I, I think at certain times it was annoying, but most of the time they were very, very supportive. Um, you know, my mom, I talked, I talk, I think I talked about this, but my mom, you know, she was like a runner and she ran like every day for a thousand days. So, you know, what? That, you Hold know, on. She, yeah. I, okay. There it is right there. I was wondering. I was like, okay. Her, her Dude, like that, okay, fine. Now it makes sense. I'm like, where are you getting this, man? Yeah, you're like, okay, fine. <laughs> well, she now was I got it. Obsessive and my, you know, my dad was an entrepreneur. He started his own. Bro, you just skirted over like that's some big deal, man. Your mom, he said a thousand for a thousand. A thousand I think days. it was a thousand days in a row. I'd have to ask her to be certain. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay, I, all right, I got you now, man. No big, right. no big deal. No big deal. Yeah, my mom's right. a I, I want to say mom's her brother did something like 10,000, something insane, like 10,000. Wow, that's crazy. Don't quote me on that. Maybe 5,000. It was something preposterous. <laughs> that's crazy. Get mom on the show, too. Yeah, where's she at? Where's she around? Man, call her up, man. Talk to her, too. Sounds uh, phenomenal, man. That's cool. All right, go ahead, brother. So I, the transition from, how far did you carry wrestling? Uh, well, so I went, I went to the University of Missouri. I won two national titles and two Hodge trophies. Uh, in 2007, I decided to, I uh, tried out for the Olympic teams, 2008, I made the Olympic team. And then I, uh, you know, unfortunately I didn't win a medal. Um, and after 2008, it was like, um, kind of an immediate transition in, into mixed martial arts. Cause I figured, uh, if I go try it, I don't like it. Then I can come back and wrestle in 2012 Olympics. You know, maybe I'll try it for a year or two. And if I don't like it, I come back. Um, but it happened that I liked it and I was kind of good at it. So I just stayed in mixed martial arts. I didn't, I mean, crossing the streams like that didn't even, I, I, I have a question for you. Yeah, when, sure. When, we, when you're growing up and, you, and when something takes a hold, I was talking to mm -hmm. my brother about this the other day. I was like, I don't know what it, I, I kind of remember what it was like when we wanted to go into the military and do that route. When it got a hold of me, it took a hold of me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I couldn't focus on anything else. I, I mean, I pulled, it wasn't the internet back then, so I just ripped magazine pages out, put it on the walls, and it kind of consumed me. And, and I, I went in that direction to where nothing yeah. else really mattered outside of that life. I mean, that we can create our own realities. If you're a fighter. I agree. There are people that will not come around you ever because you're a fighter. Wait, really? They, man, they're scared to death. There are people that are just so scared of people, they, they don't know how to talk to you. And I have to remind my guys this a lot. I was like, okay. man, you, you look scary. Like, you try to- I, I, I've heard ugly before. I've heard scary. That's the same thing. <laughs> and a lot of us paint ourselves up and we get in these environments and people, if they know your background, if they know that you can handle yourself, that's just scary to people. Yeah. Because your sure. attitude can switch and, and, and they don't know that. I have to remind Marcus of that all the time. I, I, like, I forget you, that all the time. You look super intimidating. Like, man, but you, people you, aren't going to just go up to you. Yeah, you have to go <laughs> talk to them. Scary. That's the best part about you being a coach. It's like you, you have to yeah. literally go talk to them, your neighbor. you got to go meet your neighbor. We're not going to come over. Yeah. They're not going to come out there. They're probably scared to death. And it, it, even if you do go over there, I'm all like, hey, how you doing? No, no, you know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. Marcus is super <laughs> abrasive when he talks to people, which makes it even scarier. Well, I don't think about that stuff because you and I are used to training athletes. I mean, we talk <laughs> yeah. to people a certain way. And I, this is the funniest thing. I didn't realize this till the other day. My mom, my mom was in the hospital. And she, I grew up on a horse ranch. She's a horse lady. Okay. 
she's she speaks that language like when she's she's always on horseback so her her verbiage like when stuff starts to get out of hand or she gets a little pain is, is no stop like real quick and abrupt <laughs> right so and, she's right like so. with the doctors so when the doctors <laughs> would start going to work on her and the nurses she'd be like stop no and i'd be like hammering it out and i recognize that voice it, it, it wasn't i was because i wasn't looking at her but i knew yep. what was happening and when i turned around and she, i was like something was kind of out of control i was like some people man their verbiage they can't they can't help we get our lifestyles dictate that we cut things down short sweet to the point and we inflect in a certain way and to some people man it, it's they, they can't get past that that's funny that's uh that's probably actually the number one dispute i have in my marriage and i, I have a really good marriage but sometimes she'll be like ben you're being an asshole and i'll be like what do you mean and yeah, you know, she's like well you just said this thing that way i'm like oh, that's just how i talk this that yeah oh man it's I had to learn tone it's tone and inflexion Bro, and when i got married that was, that was the biggest lessons i had learned i, I tell <laughs> everyone like my wife and i our, our, our relationship is like the weather channel bro constant updates <laughs> i can literally sit in there talking or we'll be watching something and i'll look you can feel the shift in them mm -hmm. but if you don't know how to communicate that then well, you know and i didn't in the beginning well, that's why i get quiet along we, had, uh, yeah, we uh, learned a few years ago that we are saying the same damn thing. It's just a different way. But a different way. And so yeah. we would be arguing for an hour about something. And then finally we're like, <laughs> we're Tim. actually saying the same freaking thing. Somehow, some way it'd come out. She'd say something. I'd be like, was that what you meant the whole time? She's like, yes. I was like, well, I didn't say it like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that's why I always get quiet. Podcast now, I love it. <laughs> right, you know i'm talking about yeah exactly i was like hey man guy and she's they get upset because you get quiet i was like well man i didn't not only did i not understand what you were saying i didn't know what to say myself and usually when that happens the next thing out of me is gonna be a physical reaction oh my god <laughs> ben how did you handle the you know the loss of the olympics while you were there because obviously yeah. that was a big stage for you i'm sure because there was a lot of build up to that yeah um the olympics sucks because <laughs> once you lose you don't get another shot for four years i mean in like in fighting like you may get another opportunity in three months you know in a, in a college scenario you're getting a shot at the national the next year you know and in the olympics it's four years like that that is such a that's heavy man uh, it's such a hard thing to deal with that's that, a lot like, of this, weight this yeah. opportunity only comes every four years yeah that's that's heavy when did you decide mm -hmm. not to try it uh well, it was literally pretty much right after the olympics it was uh, my wife was not my wife yet we were probably on, on on the way there um but i had been considering mixed martial arts right when i graduated college and it was like no this i've had this olympic dream for seven years so i graduated college in, in may of 07 i've had this olympic dream for seven years I'm, I'm gonna i need to see this one through um but mma was kind of always there kind of like in the hindsight and then so it was literally like the day the day that I finished, you know, lost at the Olympics, it was like, all right, well, I'm gonna go try mixed martial arts. And I think I, I think I maybe took one or two vacations, uh, after the Olympics that I figured I deserved it. Cause I had taken like one in a decade. And, um, and then right away I was, you know, right into mixed martial arts training. Um, where at, where'd you go? What gym did you go into? Back yeah. Home? So I was living in Columbia, Missouri at the time. Uh, cause that was where I went to college at. Cause this is and, right when uh, UFC MMA, you're talking about 2000, what year are we at now? 2008. Hey, 2008. So it's very, very early. It, yeah. It's still early, early, but it's stepping off. I mean, you're talking about the. Yes. All right. Yeah. It started. So yeah, I mean, MMA had a dark, so UFC, the first UFC was 1993. And then there was that dark period from like, 96 to like 2001 ish was like real you know got banned in a lot of states wasn't on a lot of tv and then zufa zufa bought it uh for keto bros and dana white and then yeah so during my college career like say 2005 six was when the ultimate fighter happened and so yeah it started getting more and more popular and i was seeing a lot of people who are you know either competitors or peers of mine starting to do really well in mixed martial arts oh is that and what it, yeah guys are transferring over right Yep. And I just, yeah, like I, said, I was drawn in by the, the combat aspect of it. I love that. It seemed fun. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was then 2008. It's like, okay, let me, let me go give this a shot. So I started training in, I think October of 2008. And I had my first fight in February of 2009 and then April of 2009. And then, so I fought three times in 2009 and then I got signed to Bellator and then 2010, I had four fights. Okay. So we're, we're talking about like switching gears. So guys who are just coming in and want to train, like you, 
Well, you can find a lot of MMMJ, MMA gyms around now. Back then, they weren't they weren't readily yeah. available. Were you fortunate enough to have one nearby? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I, I and it wasn't a great gym, right? It was a, it was a smaller venue. I, you know, I, I did like the coach I had, but you know, like there wasn't a striking coach, for example. We had a jujitsu coach, and that was really it. So I spent a lot of time on that, and obviously that was kind of more natural to me. Um, but yeah, you're right. 2008, it's like really. It's, MMA is not a big thing yet. In so how are you even getting fights? You know, was, well, I'm trying to remember back then, back then how that worked. Uh, well, 2008. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, so I I came out. Well, I was Olympian too. So who wants to fight an Olympic well, level wrestler? Well, there's that too. I I didn't even think about that. Sure. How the how yeah, the so go everyone ahead. we called said, you know, everyone we called, you know, who had a smaller promotion because at that point in time, also the the more majors. So the more majors at that point would have been. Bellator actually was just starting, starting yeah. but Strike Force at UFC and WEC, they weren't taking guys who were zero and zero. So if you had no fights, you couldn't, they wouldn't just let you, you know, come and be in their promotion. So you had to find these smaller regional circuit shows. And so everyone we called, you know, was like, oh, I'll ask so and so, you know? And then so and so would say, well, oh, it's an Olympic wrestler. You got to pay me 10 grand or something. And then, you know, the, the promotion wouldn't have the budget for that. So um, eventually I decided to put on my own show with a couple other people. So we promoted, I promoted my first two fights. Oh, there you go. Um, right. Because okay. I just needed, I needed, I knew I needed to get some fights on my record in order to move to a larger promotion. Can't find a fight, start one. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember you said, w, uh, man, I forgot about WC, right? That, yes. when that, yep. that came online after. And then the first UFC shows, those are completely different than they are. Well, it's all yeah. completely different. Then. So where was your first fight and who'd you fight? So it was, it was Columbia, Missouri. Um, I promoted it in the hometown that I was living in. Uh, his name was, uh, oh, now you're oh, come on, jo man. I think Josh Flowers was my first guy. What was it? Yeah. Josh Flowers, I think. Now I'm forgetting the second one. The second one was <laughs> Mitch, Mitch Harris, maybe. I think that was it. Yeah. Play some brawlers or what? Was it a good fight? Well, we had to find these guys. Uh, I mean, they had way, obviously, I was zero and zero. The one guy, I think, had 10 fights, and the other guy had 12 fights. So, you know, they were experience wise. No, they weren't very good, though. Oh. I mean, I was just, you know, I was an Olympic level wrestler. To their point, yeah. I was, I was, you know, significantly skilled in combat, even if I did, even Jack, if I hadn't done uh, So, MMA what was that like time. when you, I got a question. What, what's that yeah. like? So, when you train in, you knew you could wrestle. I mean, yeah. you road tested that. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. A lot of times when guys are proficient at something, then they shift over to something else. But when they yeah. have to go into the fight, they'll kind of resort back. Usually when they get tired, they get hit hard or whatever yeah. it is. What was that like? Did you? Well, I think it's good to have. I, I mean, I, I think and I think it's been proven that, you know, to have a good base in something is uh, really important. Say like, you know, and Alex Pereira, for example, who is a kickboxing world champion, was just able to he won the UFC title. And I think his eighth fight or something like that. Right. So having that really, really high level background in something is important. You just need to need to be able to find the compliments to it, you know. That's so for right. me, okay. yeah, it was jujitsu, which was, uh, you know, like I said it took kind of naturally to that, and so then you know, take them down, keep them down, beat them up. That was kind of my thing. So, <laughs> and that's body dependent too, right? Fighter dependent. Yeah. Some of those guys that get so proficient, people ask like, "Hey, what's the best martial?" The best way I can, when it happens to me, like, "Hey, what's the best gun I should buy?" Like, tell me uh, the best best pistol I should wear. I should have. Yeah, and I, you know. I know what works for myself because I, I literally laid all of them out and you go through each caliber, each one, you kind of test it out and see how, right? It's different. Well, I mean, I, I would say also in that one, it depends, probably depends on what you're trying to do with it. Well, yeah, exactly. Weapons. Well, there's that um, too. What the hell are you trying to do with that big thing? Question. That's a great yeah, question. Yeah, I mean, with MMA now, well, for a while, wrestlers were really dominant. Like there was, a, I don't remember, maybe 2013, 14, 15, somewhere in there where American wrestlers specifically had eight of the nine UFC titles. Yeah. Um, like almost all of them. And, but now you are seeing this influx of people who kind of grew up doing everything, like doing mixed martial arts, you know, whereas in the, it, you know, say five, 10 years ago, it was a lot of people who had high level backgrounds in one thing. And you still see that. And it, you know, it can be very effective, but you're seeing a lot of guys who are kind of good at everything. Cause you do have to be good at everything now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a chess match in there now. Yeah, when you yeah, went in there, bro, it was like making soup. I mean, you threw every martial art in there with the, the their physical abilities yeah. to watch them go at it to see what would do what and and yeah. what variable and what size shape. And and now, now they go in there. It's almost like who makes the mistake. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, guys, that, that, I mean, that's a lot of it, right? Or who can impose their will more significantly? Whose sure. cardio is better? Oh, yeah. Um, that, that's a big one when, when, when skill levels are equivalent. Um, yeah, but striking now is getting more and more important because for a while the guys weren't good enough at stopping takedowns. So if you know it doesn't matter how good you can punch a kick if you can't get a take the, if you can't right. stop a takedown. But now you know a lot of these guys who have high level striking also have really good wrestling defense where they're stuffing and stopping a lot of takedowns. They have the ability to keep it on their feet and then you know then their striking is more effective. And so efficient. it's it's shifting again. Yes, it def- it definitely is. I think that's how kind of all all combat arts go and. I can't speak to other things because I don't have expertise in other things, but I think you see trends come and go because oh. you know when something happens, then everyone's gonna say, Well, how do we how do we do that? Or how do we fix that? Or how do we counter that? And then everyone's focused on that problem. And then, you know, a lot of people become good at stopping whatever the problem was. And now there has to be a new problem. Well, hey, let me tell you something. If it's shifting in the fight game, the world's shifting. Yeah. That kind of moment, because it all boils down to us. The guys who are who are physically dominant like that, that that, that kind yeah. of power. I mean, and when guys get good at something, everybody watches it. Yeah. And and you know when you're seeing a good fight because people who normally don't show up to fights or anything, they're there. Yeah. For whatever 100%. the presence of death, when she shows up, man, everyone kind of pays attention to it and to watch it in its true form, like really guys just freaking battling it out, not out of yeah. hate either. I mean, out of just pure love for the fight. Yes. That, that, that's where we're at now. And you're talking about the one of the Sorry. first fights I ever went to, and I did not grow up around fighting. Oh yeah, bro! I just all. took her one. I was like, "Hey, we're going to a fight." It, not that he <laughs> takes me to a fight, but we're we were guests of like the Fertitas, so we were sitting yep. ringside. The Andrew Silva fight, where his leg gets bro, he, oh, oh, bro, she's Aaron sitting Aaron. right I'm there, literally I'm, on yeah. like sitting Dude. ringside, shotgun and blast. Boom! I mean, I don't watch that. that, that, that I don't either. I, I don't either. The minute it happened, I turned around. I I, I knew exactly what it was. I was just like, good. <laughs> I almost vomited, like dry heaving. Yeah. Oh, that's that's the worst. It's cute, for real. <laughs> it was the worst thing. I looked at Marcus. I'm like, this is what you're gonna bring. Me to? I don't remember. I think it was me and Mike Tyson were sitting there too. Me, man. He, so romantic. It was. It was so romantic. Awful. Oh, oh so, yeah. Remember that? Ah. Oh, so, when you oh, started, that, the, the leg snaps are the worst. Oh man, oh. the grossest. The, I mean, we don't even have to talk about it anymore. Still, <laughs> I'll take a big cut. I, I like those big oh, yeah. cuts. Sometimes they're kind of gross. I'll take a big cut over every day. Snap yeah, it was. I awful. mean, everything every day over that kind of that, that, that. Those are the worst, man. It was seriously oh, wow. awful. Okay, so when you started <laughs> your um your your schools, did you ever decide to incorporate any of the MMA into your teaching or just no. wrestling? No, we we haven't done that. Um, I don't know that I ever will. Maybe I, you know, I have a couple friends who, if they wanted to, say, do some grappling or something else and use the space, uh, you know, I'd allow them to do that and start their own business. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I love about wrestling is parents know exactly what they're getting their kids into. They're coming in and they want their kids to get hard work, discipline these type of really good characteristics and Hey, maybe if the kid gets really good, they'll, they'll win a state championship or go to college or something to that effect. Um, when I was training MMA gyms, I saw a lot of, uh, I would say almost delusional delusionalness and maybe misguided parenting where they're like, bring their kid and they say, my kid's going to make a million dollars and be the next superstar on TV. Mm. And it's like, you know what, if your kid goes and does that great, but that shouldn't be why you're taking your kid to the gym. You should be taking your kid to the gym because they have excess energy and they want to get it out. You want them to work, work, work ethic and discipline. You know, these type of characteristics is what you should be taking your kid to the gym for. Yeah. Oh, I'll never forget. I was standing in the kitchen. She was in there and, and I look up and my kids were climbing the walls. Yeah, literally. <laughs> yeah. I always thought that was a figure of speech. <laughs> Nope. No, it's not like the door. I lit her up. And these little bastards were li- literally climbing the walls. That's yeah. why you, what you got. You guys hope they don't jump. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they just jump and Man. you're like, well, what? Why yeah. did now you, you know that? why? Yeah. Why your neighbors invented their sports and why they did stuff like get, go over and do something, learn how to do something yeah. other than yeah. like, they would put, shimmy up the doorway up at the, the like, oh, yeah. Yeah. My all the way to one. the top. You, you gotta have something for them to get that out. <laughs> yeah. How old are your guys? Kids? 10, 10 and 11. 11. 10, 11. Okay, I got, I got nine, seven, and, and just about five. Aww. That's great. Yeah, great yeah. combo. Good Our spread, oldest man. Is 24. It's, it's um, yeah. there's something. So, 
<laughs> I was always taught to make a best friend in every town. Like where you go, man, try and make a friend over money because they'll they'll show you the town. They'll, they'll normally what you have to pay for money. They'll they'll give in kindness, especially yeah. when it comes to the kids. Like if I have a skill set you want your kids to have, send them on over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, I'll put them to work, yeah. and then vice versa. That's a good part about like our community and the way we all grew up. It's like they they mixed us together. When I was talking about when you came in with MMA, it's like a our whole lives, our generation, man, they just crashed us together. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and look what correct. it look what it created. You know, now we're trying to teach whatever it was we became down, which is tough, man, because everyone's got it's it's impressive to hear. I mean, just your story, where you come from. Yeah. And I always tell people, I was like, hey man, if I'm as extreme as I am, like if I, well, what I went through with my boys, I know you are. Because yeah, I, I would take absolutely. a break from what I was doing to, to watch you go through your stuff. I mean, that's what pulled me. I followed y'all's career your whole life. Mm -hmm. we, we never yeah. even knew each other, but we did. Mm -hmm. It just took me this long to get to you. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. That's that's how we all uh, like we look at it like that. I'm trying to teach that down. I think that's so yeah. important. I was like, man, you don't have to be from the same area, look the same. Hell, we're not even in the same profession, but I really enjoy and admire what he does and how he does it and how he teaches it. Yeah. Because it's applicable in my life. Well, I think that's one thing. Uh, I, you know, sometimes modernity or you know how we're able to be so connected on the internet kind of people crap on it a lot. But I think one of the greatest things that we have now is the ability to to dive into things that we love. So, like you know, I told you how uh, passionate I was about wrestling in high school. But I couldn't actually watch wrestling at a high level. You know, like you can't. And then. Uh, I, the Olympics was the first really high level thing I went to in person where I could actually see really, really high level wrestling happening. But now, you know, you got like a phone and I can go on my full wrestling app and I can watch college wrestling on a Friday night, or I can watch a grappling event if I'm into that, or I love disc golf too. So sometimes I'm watching disc golf. Like, so <laughs> Man, the, we got those the everywhere out here if you're ever in town. <laughs> you guys got one? Oh yeah, bro, we got them. To, you know, flip on your phone and watch, watch things you're passionate in and then you know, if you're lucky enough, you're able to connect with some of those people. Like I made friends with uh, a couple of really, really high level disc golfers. And then, you know, I get to go play with them and it's like, it's the coolest thing ever. So I, I think, I think that, uh, you know, the modern era has really provided us with some really awesome so what, things. What do you think about that? I mean, with tech, you're right. So look at what no. we became of what we had access to. Yep. They have access to every, not only just the regular how to do it. Everything. I mean, the, the best at, at people doing it and multiple yeah. sizes and shapes. Yeah. I mean, you so got to see like how wrestling so technique is moving so fast. Oh, I couldn't compared, even compared to what it was because now everybody can watch everybody else, and you and everyone sees someone do something and they think, "Wow, wow, that's good." You know, that's real. I'm going to try that, and then they try and it works for them or doesn't work for them, right. right? And so that's like that wrestling technique is moving really, really fast right now because of that. I can't even imagine what that's going to create. I mean, can you think about that? How awesome. fast? Because we're still in the in the production phases of that human i mean what they're evolving into we're still learning that there will yeah. be a plateau right when everyone kind of starts absorbing that and and you and you can actually see it it, it goes it's going so fast right now you're right man so after yeah, starting yeah, yeah. your schools you decided to write a book can you tell us about that uh well it was it was that damn coronavirus oh <laughs> um, yeah all right, I mean, all right. You know, some we, downtime we actually, <laughs> yeah we had to shut we shut we did shut down for a little bit um, and so I got to be doing something. I got to be active. I can't be sitting around doing nothing. Um, you know, literally my livelihood was stopped. And so I was like, Hey, let's, uh, how about I write a book? And so I hit up, um, uh, got him Chuck Mendenhall. He was my favorite MMA journalist. And I said, Hey, I'd really like to do this. Um, I love to read. I, I read a ton. I'll show you my, my library is actually well, uh, kind of dark back there, but you can see, I got a, nice. I got a library over there. Um, <laughs> love to read and i think not enough wrestling and MMA, mma people write books and so it was something i always wanted to do and so i hit him up and we got started and it took us a little longer than i thought but we got it done and i think it's a really really fun good read and you can learn things and you're, you're gonna have fun reading it as well what's up with the title funky what's where'd you get that uh, from? <laughs> that's my nickname i got my nickname because i was highly innovative in college um and the the style was kind of like it was called funk i don't know i don't really know why i don't know why that became the name but then my senior year of ncaa is well you don't pick your funk. nicknames bro they just get stuck on you no well okay i tried to get rid of it but <laughs> that okay, made so it worse that's why you got stuck with it i was fixing to ask you that i was like you didn't try to get rid of it did you <laughs> well one of my buddies um he 
he was on the college wrestling team and he made this shirt for NCAAs and it was my face and it just said funky on it. Of course. <laughs> and that was and that was how I got the nickname because he made the shirt and then we went and sold a bunch of the shirts and uh, and then I tried to get rid of it. Like Shit, you if you try to get rid of it, that's how I get stamped on there, bro. I, I, that, yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. I learned that lesson in the military too. Guys try to get rid of it because they'll throw it out there. That's good stuff. Hell, yep. I forgot what I was going to ask you yeah. because of it, man. That's, that's where. <laughs> I think there's something that you speak to quite often that would really apply to our listeners, which is the mindset of a wrestler. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, you guys asked me to get my best never quit story yeah, ready. So I you haven't even given me I haven't told it yet. Throw yeah. it out there, man. Let's, it. Let's go. Yeah. So I think well, I think this will speak to it. So um my freshman year of college, like I had I had started achieving really good things in high school. I had made really good progress. And then I went to college. And I had these really huge aspirations. And I was getting my ass kicked in the room every single day. And I, I was I was losing a lot of matches, my red shirt year. Um and I was at this point where like, shoot, can I really do this? Like it can, you know, I have these huge goals. Can I really do these goals or am I like, am I being ridiculous and I can't actually go and achieve them? Um, and I was, that was, you know, I was having this struggle for like months, you know, cause you go to college in August or whatever. So all through the fall wrestling is kind of funny. Cause like in other collegiate athletics, like football, right. You weren't the guy they're like, Hey man, like go sit on the bench and wear your Jersey and look cool and whatnot. And in wrestling, if you're not the guy, whoever is the guy is probably rubbing your face in the mat every day, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's not the same way. So I was having this, like, can I really be as good as I want to be type thing? And so one of the things that really brought me out of it was it was innovation. It was learning how to scramble. And it was saying, like, I really want to do this. And the way I'm doing it's not working. How can I find another way to do it? And, you know, that's eventually what I'd be known for in college wrestling. And that's why I got the name Funky. But it was like I really had to, like, think outside myself and start looking for other options because I was already working hard. I couldn't work harder. Right. That wouldn't have. I was kind of at, like, max capacity as far as workload was concerned. But it was like, okay, how else can I do this? And I had to like strive for other ways to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Man, that's huge to shift like that in your head. Yeah. Because most people will keep burning down on one, keep going that same direction, and yeah, and, and not turning that around. How how'd you do that? Um, I think it was, I, mean, I think a lot of it, I always say it was out of desperation because I I wanted to achieve these things and I was I wasn't having the success I wanted to. So it was like, shit, how could I do this? You know, and I think it was kind of just a piece by piece thing. It wasn't like it all came at once. And even over the course of my college career of, you know, five years, of like it was a constant evolution, like from one year to the next, it was better and better and better. But um, yeah, I think it was just me, my, my willingness to not accept that um, whatever my fate was going to be my fate and I could figure out a different way. And so it started with like picking up one or two things and they start, and then I started having a little more success. And then I, you know, I'm like, okay, that's working. And then I pick up another thing and I have a little more and then, you know, and, and it's like a snowball. Right. And I start, and I realize what I'm doing is working. And so I just keep kind of adding to it, adding to it. And I, as I add to it, I, I kept getting better and better results. Uh, question. So it's really a mindset thing. Yeah. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Once yeah. you shifted your mindset that you don't have to be conventional on what you've been taught this yeah. whole time, you, that's when it snowballed. Uh, this is what gets overlooked. And I don't ever talk about this, but if, when you do shift, there are those little wins in your day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's still the kick in the face as you're yeah. making the shift. Yes. That, that, that's how you yeah. know. And, <laughs> yeah. And like, so I mean, I, sometimes I feel like I don't talk about hard work enough because obviously I, like I, said, I was working really, really, really hard. Uh -huh. And but you said, you know, like some guys just keep working hard and they never, ever say like, I, I think it's just problem solving, right? Well, what I'm doing is not working. What else can I do? Or how can I do this a little bit differently? And what happens with certain guys who work really, really, really hard, in, in wrestling, I'm speaking to, I'm not speaking to life, although it's likely to be true. Yeah, um, yeah. If you keep working really, really, really hard and you know you're working hard, but you're not getting any better results, that starts to become really depressing. It sure. starts to be oh, demotivating because you're like, I'm doing everything I can do and I'm not getting the results I want to get. What am I going to do? And it's because they won't take the extra step and say, well, how do I be a problem? What is my problem? Mm -hmm. Cause my problem is I'm not working hard enough. I'm, I'm working really hard. And that was where I was at. Like, I know I'm working as hard as I need to work, but I'm not having the success. So I need to be a problem solver. I need to figure it out, man. All right. Well, we got guys down here that, that are taught 
Hey man, don't ask questions. Like just bust your ass getting that. Like so guys come yeah. out of the military. Some of them are taught, man. You know what? We tell you what to do. The guys who come out in middle rank, mm-hmm. and they will bust their ass and work as hard. They'll swing that hammer at that rock, knowing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. thinking they'll get through it, and yeah. taught never to think otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they die swinging that hammer, that's so be it. That kind yeah. of mentality. Never, never thinking. Hey man, that this is what I'm doing is stupid. There's that that oh I. I there is a different way someone didn't teach you or, or, yeah. Oh, not only when you got to here, there's something else. They left that part out. Or move well, your yeah. hip over to the Yeah. Left. Yeah. What, what, whatever, <laughs> whatever happens, whatever yeah. happens to them, know that that does happen yeah. And, yeah. And, and add that to it. It's like, Hey, so if you find yourself in that, that, that problem, that's why it's so important to have people around you, man. Well, that and I know, I know the military, I can't speak to the military cause I haven't been in it. So I don't, I don't even want to comment cause I'll, I'll probably sound ignorant, but like in my wrestling room, for example, I want everyone thinking about problems and asking questions because sometimes you never know where the answer is going to come from. And, you know, I tell a story, you know, the, the three kids in there are all having high level college success now, but they were in high school at the time. And we were doing this one move and they said, no, I think this is the way it's going to work, you know, or I think this other way is going to work. And I told them, no, that's wrong. And I was an NCAA champion Olympian, you know, and they said, no, I don't think so. I said, okay, listen, you guys keep doing it. I think I'm right. And if for some reason you're right, I guess we'll figure it out. And they kept doing it. And sure enough, and within a couple months, I'm like, you know what? You guys are right. That's pretty freaking good. You know? <laughs> That's and stoic so like wisdom. The openness to, to figuring out things from any perspective. And when you have a whole bunch of people trying, trying to solve a problem, then you're way more likely to get an answer than if it's just one like top-down authoritarian type thing. Sure. Oh, well, yeah, because yeah, you're not throwing out an answer. You're actually creating another problem. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, that applies to everything, everything. in life. Yeah, everything. I mean, if you just stop and reflect and think, okay, it could be in relationships, it could be in work, whatever it is, if you're still just failing or every day is a bad day or whatever, just stop and reflect and think, okay, what can I, not what they can do, because we can always put blame on everybody else, but what can I do to change this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a huge one. And, and just being being a problem solver, being open to other, you know, other ways of doing things that that was kind of huge for me. And it's been huge for me in a lot of different ways. I mean, now with our wrestling academies, um, no one's ever done wrestling academies kind of the way, you know, my brother and I are doing it. And so it's been a constant problem solving. And have we made all of the right moves? The answer to that's no. Right. But it's like you can be paralyzed by this fear of like, well, I can only do it this this one way because that's the only way anyone's ever done it. Or you can just, hey, I'm going to go take some chances. I'm going to try some things. I'm going to see what works. I'm going to try to keep what works. I'm going to try to throw away what doesn't work and keep moving forward. Yeah. Well, we love what, we're, what you're doing yes. and by teaching the next generation and bringing them up. It's really awesome. Yeah, one of my teachers, he, as I got older, he would always say, hey, man, it feels good sometimes to go down and put a white belt on it or, or go in somewhere. <laughs> For you know real. I mean? And just go in there without any expectations, knowing what you know. Just go in there and sit and listen or get rolled up. Uh, um, yeah. When someone doesn't have any idea what you're capable of, and they, it, 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 that's the best part about making age, too. It's kind of like somebody walking in and trying to explain the manual to the guy who wrote it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, yeah. You understand I, what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, you know, sometimes you sit back and you're like, okay, I, I completely get what you're saying. That's not how you're supposed to say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but now since you did say it like that, I completely understand where where you're coming from. I get how you're. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? How how that happens? Just just by people getting a, a visual of it and 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 trying to learn it by themselves. I always talk about, and I had to learn this through life. Is um like the Karate Kid. Man, you, you can sit there and you got this book and you're going through it. And man, you're, you, man, you're a badass learning it at home until you walk in there into a schoolhouse when there's a teacher there mm-hmm. and, and they <laughs> and they can put it on you and they sharpen yeah. it. They sharpen the crap out of you. It, it's something. <laughs> so if you had if you're in your house doing it by yourself and you've got that drive for it, man, and you get out there and somebody can help you and, and kind of shave it because teachers are temporary. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the great ones are temporary. And applying the Mr. Miyagi method always works. 
We yeah, I'm old school, about. man. I, I got stuck What's in the that. Mr. Miyagi method? The Karate Kid? The, yeah. Well, I watched it, but it's been so many years. I oh, don't my gosh. Oh, just make them work. You need to go yeah, it's got with your kids. Wax on, wax off. I remember that. Yeah, yeah same thing. You, I mean, basically, on, you do the same off. thing. You know, it's like discipline. You it's, live by example. You make them work. And inside the, the, the work that they're doing, they'll, they'll learn. It's discipline through work. Yeah. And so the, the in Mr. Miyagi and Karate Kid, he made the kid constantly do work he was painting the fence he was waxing the car he was doing all this shit that he did not want to do all he wanted to do was learn karate and mm. the instructor is te- is basically making him do chores and he thinks that's what it is but in the end he realized that the discipline through work is what got him to win yeah it gave him the ability for self-defense yeah, the same way with him- verbiage like if you sit and talk with somebody all the time like when we joke back and forth re- athletes yeah. are great at this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean that's an offense and a defense that's a, a verbal sword that we that we are really proficient at i mean normally a, a, a great <laughs> fighter would talk you out of it like you, you, the minute they would step up you could talk them out of it they'd just be so scared they couldn't even <laughs> use their whole body yeah and uh um, real it, it, it's funny, man. You can sharpen yourself in in multiple ways, and that's the best part about having people around. And, and this day and age, man, you get online. There's somebody out there to teach you some stuff. Like you can't even imagine what you're capable of. All right, yeah. you and your kids watch Karate Kid One this week. <laughs> it's one of the I, you know I share because actually my buddy Tyron was in uh, the the Cobra Kai thing. So I have that's great, me. right? I mean, that, that's no. like five or six seasons into that thing. I, I bought uh, Daniel LaRusso's, not even Daniel, not Daniel LaRusso either. It's Ralph really Macchio. good. <laughs> I bought his book the other day, right on the plane. Marcus did karate his whole life, so we're really into it in our house. <laughs> well, I, I was awesome. sitting I was sitting in the schoolhouse watching UFC 1. Uh-huh. I remember when we got to really? see Oh, yeah. Absolutely, brother. Uh, all of them. I followed through the dark through the dark years. I watched I watched that. When I got separated from, from it, is kind of when I joined the military. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Usually, because well, we're it was hard back in the day, man. You couldn't just like, like I mean, right? I'm talking about wrestling where you could flip out your phone. Oh, we'd like, have that. You'd like go to the Blockbuster and find the VHS. <laughs> oh, yeah, or, beat like, down, right? Exactly. Yeah, but that, that's right. Oh, Blockbuster. Or if you saw a fight in your school or something, that's how you got privy to all of that, man. And, and, but if kids could fight, you didn't go mess with them, so you kind of stayed away from it. It's just we got saturated with that stuff. And I remember the UFC was a big deal when there'd be a fight on because they were few and far in between. And I like yeah. you had your ass was in the chair watching that sucker go down. Now you turn it on. That's that. Yeah, I don't even know. It's hard to keep up I, with them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's on like about just about every weekend. Yeah, every yeah. Weekend. That, I mean, but it did go in that dark era where no one could find it, and you had to like, you know, go hunt it down at a remember that a store somewhere. Like a try, take one video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take one. That was list. before. That was before <laughs> you could even like. Uh, I mean, maybe shortly after that would be like, uh, what was that company called? Um, uh, where you could download the fu- Napster, Napster where you could yeah, yeah, download yeah, right. videos and stuff like that would happen eventually. Yeah, right? but it was definitely not in the beginning. In the beginning, of the UFC it was like literally VHS. You got to go find the VHS yeah, yeah, somewhere. Too. That yeah, is hilarious. Right. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. And um, how can our listeners find you and buy your book and yeah. support you and everything you do? Uh, yeah, books on Amazon, and Barnes and Noble. I think it's a it's a really fun read. Um, I am mostly active on Twitter. I'm on Instagram too, but I don't really like Instagram. I, I enjoy Twitter, the back and forth banter. There's a lot of good information on there. Um, so that that's where I spend. The and your handle on that is? What's up? Your That'd handle on something. Twitter? Uh, it's just Ben Askren, at Ben Askren. Okay. No funky yep. nothing? <laughs> no <Yeah>. funky nothing. <laughs> <laughs> funky Ben. <laughs> That's awesome, brother, man. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this. I and, appreciate and your you, man. podcast, do you want to plug your podcast? Uh, I just, I'm just i on Flow Radio. So I actually, we stopped the crypto show about nine months ago, just in time for the bear market. Um, so I'm on Flow Radio. Talking <laughs> Why, about did wrestling you know something? Three mornings. <laughs> he knew something. He knew something. <laughs> uh, you know what? It was it was the start of the bear market. And I, you know, I got too busy doing other things, unfortunately. Um, I maybe I'll start it up again if I get some more time. I so, still love Bitcoin. What now? I mean, it's got you got family. Why, like, tell us about what you're into now. I mean, I, I know you're running your gyms, but like your personal life, you don't mind. Every family, everybody's yeah, good. Holidays, podcast, everything's good. Coach wrestling and hang out with my family. That's pretty much it. That's awesome. Yeah. And as far as I mean, the way we came up, I just want this is between me and you. This is offline if you want. I, okay. Like how we how we came up with the fight game and everything changed. Mm-hmm. The, the best part of it now is passing that back, sitting at the house with the family. And, yes. and it is, right? Oh, I, I love coaching wrestling. I mean, I really, really love it. It's, it's kind of what I always knew I was going to do. And yeah, I mean, I feel like that's passing on to the next generation because you get to 
impart all the wisdom and skills and knowledge you have into other people. And you get to work with your brother. I think that's really awesome. Y'all yeah. y'all yeah. still pretty close. Yeah, I mean, we talk like probably every day. I mean, at least at least once a day, every day about something. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm sure. the same way it is in our house too, man. Yeah. Well, awesome. All right, brother, well, man. I hope you. to link up face to face one day. Yeah. God bless you. Have a Merry sure. Christmas. Take care. Thank you, Marcus. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. See you guys every Bye. day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.